Hey, what's up? And welcome to Freestyle Lives on Stereo with Latif and Angel, a new platform where we come together to discuss various topics regarding the freestyle music scene, where it's been, where it's at, and most important, where it's going. But we can't do it without you, the freestyle community. We encourage you to join in the discussion, ask questions, share with us your ideas and opinions, because together, we believe that we can define this culture as it was meant to be and not only enjoy it, but also benefit from the many opportunities it has to offer. If you're not already following us, please do so now so that you never miss an episode. And today's topic, today's topic is mm -hmm. freestyle music, freestyle music, quality versus quantity. Hey wife, you on the line? I sure am. How are you, babe? How, I'm good. How was that intro? That was awesome. I was just going to tell you that. You sound so professional. <laughs> nah. no, what I want to do is I, I want to make sure that, you know, we, um, that we at least provide the information. We set the platform so that way people know what this is about, what we're trying to do. Also, you know, encourage people to, to be involved, to, uh, to speak, to share their opinions, to share their thoughts. I don't, I don't want this to, to be a platform where like it's all about us and our ideas and what we have to say um i i feel that you know tapping into the community into their ideas because let me tell you something sometimes i speak to people and it's incredible the, the knowledge they have the ideas that i've never even thought of before um it just shows that you know we we do we have a really a really smart community and, and I think it's important that we tap into that. Exactly. That's why it's great to use them as a sounding board. Oh yeah. Oh, we tell I mean, them our we ideas. Got... What we, we tell them our ideas. We tell them what we think and they get to tell us their ideas and what they think about the situation. Right, right. Or, or at the very least, we set the platform to allow people to come on and, and, and begin a dialogue on some of the issues that we're facing. Some of the good stuff as well as some of the bad stuff to try to try to see if we could, you know, do something. We're going into a new year. We just left a crazy ass year. We don't know what's coming tomorrow. <clears throat> uh, but I lost no hope in this genre. I have so much faith and so much confidence in the genre, which consists of people. Keep in mind, the genre isn't music. It's people, it's human beings. And um I, I just feel that you know we just need to we just need to create some sort of dialogue so that way we're all facing in the same direction. Mm -hmm. You know, right? Absolutely, yes, yes. But um, I agree. but it's a great topic, also. You know, which came up. So with, you know what? Yeah, br br talking about the speaking of the topic. Okay, so I, I want to go back. Okay, because you know okay. this is the deal. The times now are so much different than when you first started popping, okay? Right. All right? Not just for you, but for everybody who was popping back in those days, okay? Quality mm -hmm. versus quantity meant something totally different. It was it was a whole different, what, what do you remember? Let's go back, forget about now. Let's go back, how, what do you get from that? Let's apply that to CoverGirl stuff, going into the studio, who you worked with, kind of studios, you know, what what do you feel back in those days? What was more important? Absolutely quality was more important quality. back then, not I quantity. Agree. Because right. they would take time in between singles, they would take time in between albums, you know, quite a right. bit of time, actually. Right, right. And you know what one of the reasons were? You know why? Why? Studio time was freaking expensive. Oh yeah, yeah. That's so why people used do... to say, "When are you in the when are you in the studio?" I'd be like, "Overnight." They'd be like, "Overnight," because that was the cheapest yeah. time. Off peak. And Off -peak I actually hours. liked recording at that time. That was the time I liked yeah. recording, though. I really did. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot of people. Those are, those times were fishy. For the the reason being is, do you know if you record or mix a record overnight? or you mix or record a record during the day and you listen to both those mixes side by side, do you know they won't sound the same ever? Yes, yes, I've heard of that. Yeah, not that one is worse and one is bad. They just won't sound the same because 
during the day, even though we don't hear it, there's a lot of noise in the world. There's a lot of noise happening. Mm -hmm. We don't, we're mm -hmm. immune to it, but we don't hear the, the cars going by. We don't hear the people talking in the distance. We don't hear the airplanes going by, the right. trains, the commotions. We don't hear that stuff during mm -hmm. the day because we're so, we're so immune to it. We're so used to it. It's just like if you have an apartment by the subway. After a while, you don't even hear the subway anymore. You right. know? I used right. to knew people, I knew people that live like, I swear, like eight feet from the, the train user in Queens, the train would turn on the seven train. And it was like, I swear, it looks like it was eight feet from the window. And I knew somebody that lived in that building. Mm -hmm. I said, like, how do you do that? Like, how? and the thing is, remember, it's a train that's turning. So you're getting that mm -hmm. squeaking sound that, right. you know what I mean? Right. You yes, know? yes. So it was yes. like, you know, how do you, how did you deal with that? You know, and it's like, they were like, well, after a while, you really don't even hear it anymore. I was like, wow. <laughs> and I could believe that. Right. I could believe that. But, uh, but yeah, but, but then if you go at nighttime, like the time that you, the world is still, there's like no noise. It's like dead silent. So when right. you go to mix, you, you're hearing things are sounding different. But yes, you know, back in those days, um, quality was very important. You had one chance to get into that studio. People mm -hmm. would spend, you know, a few weeks recording vocals. So they'll spend months producing the track. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks. Like, what was an average amount of time you spent? Just vocals. Just vocals. We were really quick. What? We were really yeah. quick. You know, they were definitely on a budget. Hey, you got to do this yeah. in one day. Hey, you got to do this in two days. Right. So, yeah, right. no. I, they definitely pulled, you know, they were, they were penny pinches. Right. But even though, even though they, um, you recorded in a day or two days that at the most, um, you gotta, there's a lot of days that were also spent mixing those vocals down. Right. Right. Absolutely. You know, you know, right. so, you know, it was a lot of time spent and then, then the average amount back in the days, I remember, even though people didn't really do it, the magic number for a mix down was 30 hours. Right. Yeah. I mean, I spent 30 hours. I remember that they also, always... yeah, they also had to create the music. So that was time in the studio as well. Right, that's right. The pre-production, all the productions in the right. beginning before they, and a lot of times, you know, they did that way ahead. The demo. Remember, they would do a demo as well. Right, they times. would do the right. They would do right. They would do the demo. That was a, a whole other thing, and then you know, go into production, and then go into the mix, and then of course bring in other remixes to come in and do different mixes while the board was still fresh, and uh, right. so it was a big process, and it was back in those days. I think D and D. When we first started on on an off peak night, on the off peak, uh, D and D was something like forty five dollars an hour, fifty five dollars an hour. Mm. You know, um, right. Manny used to get it. Manny used to get the the, the studio time basically for free because he used to mm -hmm. do their access their their databases. Right. And I remember him telling me that he goes, "Yeah, you ever want to trade off some services? Create databases." So I went in, I started learning how to do databases. And I remember wow. I was going to start a, I was going to do this company where I was going to create a central database for hot dog stands in Manhattan. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah I was going to create a I system. Never knew that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's funny because I never thought years, about I it. Never, until we I never it knew that. Yeah. I was going to create a, a central uh, database, right? Where um, mm. I could print out stuff. I could print out stuff for the, for the hot dog stands and the vendors. So that way they could mm. keep inventory. You know, wow. and they, we could just, they'll Crazy. give me the information. I'll, I could print that stuff out. Yeah, it was going to be a ton of work. I never, I never moved forward. Uh, it just, it didn't hold my interest. It didn't hold my interest long enough, you know? Right. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, that was, um, that was, that was, you know, that was the thing, you know, you're talking about studio time, you know, $50 an hour and, uh, yeah, they try to do it as, as, as quick as possible, you know? Right. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, now, nowadays, so yeah, so, so, you know, so yeah. So basically what I was trying to say was, you know, so back in those days, they had that one shot. Very rarely did they want to go back into the studio and have to correct stuff. That, that was a pain. Right. Right. People try not to do that because sometimes you'll bring the, you bring the track to, to the, to the label mm -hmm. and then the label's like, okay, but this ain't happening. This ain't. And you have to go and now bring it back. And that was a hassle to go right. back into the studio to fix it. That's like, oh my God. 
you know, and that could cost a ton of money. And, you know, so people, people didn't do that. People didn't do that. You know, uh, it was, it was, um, it was, uh, they took their time. They took their time. Right. Uh, so quality, you couldn't go into a studio and say, yo, I'm, unless you have an unlimited budget and you just got it like that, or you own the studio, or you have a real good hookup where you could go in there and you have unlimited of time. I remember, I remember rappers who used to be able to go into a studio to write, to mm -hmm. create. That was bananas. I was like, what? So they would just go into the studio, they would create the track on the fly, and the rappers would sit around and they'll start rapping, and they'll start writing right there. I'm like, wow. So they're spending all this money just to come up with the idea. Right. <laughs> you know? That's crazy. That's crazy. Now, Right. Now we got, all right, so now, now we, you know, we come, you know, in the, like, in the 90s, let me see, it wasn't even in the 90s, like the late 80s, um, people started gro grabbing hold of home studios. Right. That's when the home studio, I know that's when I started building mine. Uh, they were, exp it was expensive. Um, um, just one, you could build right now, you could build a, a good home studio for probably the price of one or two pieces back then. Um, mm -hmm. but that's when, uh, people came in, they started to build these home studios. Some of them had pretty elaborate ones. I remember some of them had nice, I remember a few, quite a few people, uh, that, um, I've been to their offices or their homes and they had really, they had the beautiful, uh, uh, Mackie boards and big ones and there was another board they used to use i forgot um and that's when things started getting a little it was like oh wow you know and i i started seeing the potential at that point i was like wow so these people could come in here and they got like unlimited time they could produce and they could really come up with stuff you know right. they could take the right. time and they could really they could really polish it but what they were doing instead is um i remember metropolitan was paying like three thousand dollar advance for tracks which was nothing. You, you, know, you know, speaking of Metropolitan, to me, they did both. They did quality and quantity. Because they seem to be <clears throat> spitting out songs more than anybody. Well, remember, they yeah. weren't producing. They were distributing other labels. Okay. You know, so if you look at a lot of those labels, a lot of those, those were outside producers. But by that time, by that time, yeah, the home studios became, became popular, you know, by that time. You right. know, and uh, and people would be able to go into the studio and just. But what happened was because of the advances that were given. Because remember, now comp comp compilations became popular. I know I did two of them. The compilations. compilations. Right. Yeah. yeah. What did I say? Compilations. I said. Com I said com why did I say that? I'm like. Oh, you make it up your own language again. You got that last week. <laughs> yeah. I'm I haven't used, I think I haven't used that word in so long I forgot how to say it. That's crazy. <laughs> compilations. Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. I I worked six six years with compilations. But anyway, um yeah. yeah, so what what was happening then at that point when the compilations became popular, um, um, and it was just, it was definitely a smart, smart move. And I, I believe, well, I think hot productions, I think they were one of the first ones to to start doing that. And then there was uh um, the other one that used to be always in the supermarkets, you used to find them. Yes, uh, yes. Quali exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so those, those, uh, those companies started doing these compilations and yeah. it made sense to them because what they were doing is they were paying, they were buying the stuff outright pretty much. Um, and they were paying, you know, I mean, you could get a, really, you could get a track produced for, you know, $500, $300, $1,000, some of the, mm -hmm. the, the, the heavier hit of production producers like the Victor Frankels and stuff, they were getting like the three grand. Uh, my crew got three grand. Um, and uh, when they would do that, right? So they would pay, they would, they would get the three grand and the labels, like let's say Metropolitan would pay this. And then they would put this all into a compilation and they would release the compilation. And whatever right. song popped from that compilation was the song that they would pull and create a single and it would try to run with it at that point right right you know so at that mm -hmm. point it wasn't it really wasn't the quality was subjective quality was you know 
was dependent on the producer who was submitting the track. Some producers right. just naturally were good. They were naturally good, and they they had a little bit more pride in their work. Enter pride in their work. Yeah, yeah. Like to me, like the Victor Frankos, he he took a little more time, sometimes a little too long, to produce a track, but you heard it. You can hear it in the quality. But took... Speaking of Victor Franco, you know that was one thing I always wanted to work with him, and I never got to work with him. Well, we tried to remember. Yeah, I'm saying, but girl. I, I never, I never got to work with yeah. him. You know, like really, yeah, you know, put yeah. out, put out something with him. Yeah. I always wanted. Right. To, he was very, very talented. Yeah, yeah, he was a yeah, but you know, and, yeah, and going, I thought he and I, I thought he and I vibed very well together. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Victor, Victor was good. Victor was good. And then you had the Adam Morano collage. Now yeah. Adam was talented, but but very but, talented. But Adam was about quantity. He did uh -huh. quality to a point. To a point. I'll tell you the he truth. Did, I really like the stuff. I always liked yeah. the stuff. A lot of people did. That's why he was successful. A lot of people liked this. I like you know what I liked about his stuff. It was very easy. It was very right. easy. You know, easy music, well, easy vocals, like. Right. Well, because he was spinning. Well, maybe that was the, the plot. Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. It made it easier for him to to mass produce this stuff. Right. You know, where he could go in and he could spit out. You know, ten. ten I heard him talk about putting an album together. In a day, <laughs> in a, I can believe it. In a day, you know, and he's album. another one. I think if he and I would have worked together, we'd have had so so much work. Yeah. You know, we'd have had so much uh, product. Because yeah. I'm the same way. I'll go in there and I'll stay yeah. all day, all night yeah. working. So he went and he, you know, he huh? invested in his own in his own studio. He had a nice home studio, and he yeah. didn't, you know, Adam didn't need to bring his product anywhere. He didn't have to bring it to a, another plant to mix it. He didn't have to bring it someplace else to do vocals. Um, the uh -huh. only thing that everybody pretty much used was a mastering plan. And I think later on, everybody killed that also. So everybody was doing like Dick Charles, who was in Manhattan. I remember because I was the one that yeah. used to have to deliver, deliver the masters I, yeah, I to Dick him. Charles. <clears throat> and then he also did my uh, my compilations as well. And, um, uh -huh. and people would bring them down. And basically all he would do was he would neutralize. He had the sweetest job, the job that Dick Charles had was nothing. It was all mm -hmm. computer. That's why you weren't allowed to sit there while he masked it, because everybody yeah. had the idea that he sat there tweaking knobs. Everybody thought he he was tweaking knobs while he was um, uh, mastering, but he wasn't. He was just running it through a system that neutralized right. it. And basically, what it would do is just bring up all the levels and even out all the levels. So if the if the drums were too loud and the keys were a little low, it would basically find that medium and and kind of neutralize it if the vocals were too loud it will it will bring the vocals down so it was uh mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was uh you know that was his job and he wouldn't because of what he charged i forgot what it was he wouldn't allow you to sit in there because i remember one time i asked him i said hey can i sit in here with you like why you master he goes if you do that he goes i charge this much per hour damn he goes, because yeah he goes because what's gonna happen he goes you're going to want me to change this. You're going to want to put input that. He goes, but if you just let me do my job and you trust me, everybody else does and just come pick this up tomorrow or whenever I had to pick it up, he goes, then this is the price. So whatever, if it was $500, you know, yeah. you get in and out. But if you mm -hmm. want it to sit in there, it was like $100 an hour. <laughs> you know? Quick, quick question. Quick, quick question. When you were doing your compilations, mm -hmm. what was more important to you, quality or quantity? Quality for me, okay. for me, but that was because I was just starting. Right. I so I had to make a name. So, and I didn't have my own studio and mm -hmm. I didn't have any money. I couldn't, you know, I basically had people work on the strength. I had people work on hopes and dreams. I sold, that's what I sold. That was my commodity. I was able to sell hopes and dreams and I had right. connections. So people knew that I could make things happen. Um, right. You know, so I would convince people uh, to come on board and um, and but I wanted quality. So I was really I looked for people that can um, that can really produce that can that, that, you know, took some pride in it. And I didn't have one person do 10 tracks. So right. I think 
most of the tracks, like most of the tracks on the compilations I've done were all like from different producers. There might be one or two track tracks that had like the same producer. The second right. compilation, we had one producer do most of it and you can hear the difference. You can hear it was, it was whack. That was that guy yeah. Pompeo. And I, I yeah. could, yeah, I wasn't, I just, I could not, I couldn't get down with his stuff. It just, I wasn't, I wasn't feeling. It. That's when basically I folded that, you know, I was like, you know, but, um, but yeah, at that point it was quality. I mean, I, I know, I know how you work. I know you're all about quality, but I you remember, I wasn't around when you did that. Right. So I was wondering right, where I, your mind was. I was yeah, wondering where your mind was back well, then. Well, I was trying to, you know? I was trying to bring, I was trying to make a name for the label for Style and Free, mm -hmm. you know, and I knew, you know, I had to, um, I had to, I had to bring it, you know, and I had to, and I did, there was a few songs that people liked and it, it launched a couple little careers and it did well, it did well. Um, I, I just had a really good network, which is why I superseded a lot of people. It wasn't because I had the greatest tracks, um, but I had the biz the best uh, business formula. So when you had all these other labels, I think back in that time, oh my God, we had Prime Records, we had uh, Artistic Records, we had uh, oh my God, there was a, there was quite a few. There was quite a few um, that were we were all pretty much at that same level. Um, however, though they were putting out incredible material and a lot of it my stuff went further i was able to get my stuff pretty much <clears throat> once social media kicked off of course that opened up more doors for more people um right. but uh but i was already because remember one of my main guys used to be a, a flight attendant and this is before this is before 9 11. so when i used right. to press cds i used to give him i used to meet him at the LaGuardia airport and i used to drop mm -hmm. him off two or three cases so he would call me he goes Hey, I'm going, I'm flying to Detroit after New York. Do you want me to pick? I said, yeah, I'm gonna bring you two cases. Then I would get on the phone and I would contact my Detroit uh, record, record store. Remember I did retail marketing. So I was in, I had the connections with all the record companies, all the record stores all over the country. So I had these really good right. relationships, you know? So he would go and he would deliver these CDs. And that's how, and people used to tell me, yo, everywhere I go, man, I see your CDs. How, how, how are you doing this? Like. Cause that was hard to yeah. do, but people yeah. like me, people like yeah. me. Plus my relationship with Susie, they right. knew that when I came to town, we were going to their store for in store. So yeah, I had a little leverage. Right. They didn't want to tell me no. Yeah. They didn't want to tell me no. Cause it was, then I would tell them no. And they, and when we, and when I did an in store with Susie, you couldn't even walk in those places, <laughs> you know? Right. Right, <laughs> and they yeah. sold a lot of records so you know so it yeah. worked hand in hand it, it worked out you know and it and it helped out but um but then i understood not to, not to get off subject not to get off subject for a second but um do you think it's important to do what you did you learned so many different aspects of the industry and you executed so many different aspects of the industry do you think that's important if you have, if you have the if you have the opportunity to learn them you see i was play i didn't chase them I was placed in these opportunities in these in these areas, so I had mm -hmm. to learn them. You know, I, yeah. I worked at Metropolitan. My job was retail marketing. I had to learn it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I would have to go downstairs and work the plant, and so mm -hmm. I had to learn it. I got went on the road with Susie as a road manager. I had to learn it. Um, we didn't want to, you know, deal with the agents no more. So to Tony said, "Hey, why don't you start book? Why don't you book her? You got all the connections with the promoters." I started getting to book it. I had to do it. You know what I mean? So. I learned all these so things. Do you, think, do you think that helped your career in the industry? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. But, you know, um, but, and that was one of the reasons, you see, I, I figured that out a long time ago. And that was one of the reasons why I turned down quite a few um, great opportunities with like Virgin Records, um, CEG, Pyramid at that time. Uh, so mm -hmm. I had a, a handful of people that offered me positions because. I didn't want to get stuck doing that one job. But you know what's so funny? You know what's so funny? Um, you learned the management from Tony. So I think that's what makes you such a caring manager because he was managing his daughter. Right, yeah. So it's so funny, but check this out. I also uh -huh. learned a lot of my management from Manny Garcia. So Manny was actually my first real experience. Well, Manny like is a very caring person as well. You know? Right. I'm talking about where we've actually pulled on artists. See, with Susie, I had to, I was, it was an observation. 
And mm -hmm. I, what I did, what I think, what I learned from that was just me how to be on the road and how to keep in mind who I work with and make sure mm -hmm. she's good and make sure I'm not. It kept me, it kept me on the straight and now. I'll tell you that one thing. And she was a minor. So I, ha I had to be on the yeah. straight and now. I couldn't, I wasn't a drinker, but I couldn't go get drunk. I couldn't go mess around. I couldn't go while she went to a hotel, go to a club and dance and hang. I couldn't do that. That was that. So, and so I maintained that, you know? But you know, what I was saying was um, going back to Metropolitan, I understood when 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 I when I started dealing with all the compilations, I understood uh -huh. the idea behind it and it made so much sense at that time. And then right. you'll get a lot of people, a lot of people till today will say the compilations are what ruined freestyle. Huh. People will say that. Really? Yeah, I never knew people, that. Yeah, people would tell me, yeah, it was all those damn compilations full of crap. That, that ruined huh. freestyle. And I, I don't, I think it's actually opposite. Yeah, I mean, I they did compilations from pop music, they did compilations of all types of music. Didn't ruin yeah. that. No, no, but for freestyle I in particular. Don't read that. They did compilations on R&B. They did compilations on everything. Right, right. But but what happened was freestyle became like, like people weren't, like if you got an album from an artist, it was almost mm -hmm. like you didn't get your money's worth. Like albums became very, the only time you could sell an album was if you did really well on one of those compilations, hmm. okay? Because we used yeah. to try to get certain albums, but Jerry got to a point where he didn't put out any more albums. It was all about the compilations because people felt they got their money's worth. Yo, they paid $10 and right. they got 15, 20 songs, you know? 10 songs and different artists. Small... And different artists. Right, and then you know, so people love yeah. that man. And then I remember yeah. people started bootlegging them. They became bootlegged, and believe it or not, even that I believe helped the industry. Right, that was a big asset because it made it so popular. We, you, do yeah. you know, in Texas there used to be stores. I don't know how these things existed. There were stores that were like entirely bootlegs. Like the entire store was bootlegged. There were like mixes, and and I was like, "How the hell?" That's crazy. Did they do this? Yeah, they started to get shut down later on. But I remember when that was that people were ratting them out, and it started to get a little crazy. But people used to have a problem with it. <clears throat> I didn't. I saw the. I I had seen the benefit of it a long time ago. I right. Said, this is crazy. I said, this is great because you got to realize these people are putting together compilations with your song on it, and then they're going out there and they're pushing the hell out of it. So now, right. now all of a sudden, suddenly you have all these independent distributors and all these independent promoters pushing your stuff. And what that right. did, what that did is it opened up the doors for performances, which is how the artists are getting paid. Listen, Collage didn't I mean blow up because, because it was just his album. It was, right. He was on like every compilation. Same thing with Susie. Right. Find a find a freaking compilation that doesn't have "Take Me in Your Arms" on it. Right. I don't but, think um, I'll find one. What uh, do you think those compilations were quality or quantity? Quantity. Even the one, even the ones that did well. Yeah, You're like you might have a two or you know a few songs in there that the producers were just phenomenal. So it, so it was, yeah, those were of quality. But now it was a, you know why it was quantity? You want to know why it was quantity? Why? Because they was, now they, instead of one song, they could submit the compilation and get, you know, three to five grand for the whole compilation. Give them to whoever, give it to Metro, give it to whoever else was the, Hot and Metropolitan were like the two compilation distributors. Those were like the two, from what I remember, I could, I could be off, there might be a, a label that's missing. But those were the mm -hmm. two ones that you went to with compilations and they will pay you. Three to five grand. So what happens once you got your three grand? You're like, oh shit, got three grand? And I don't think they offered any kind of back end royalties. Like, right. The only way for you to get back end royalties, like you had to go through like your, you know, Harry Fox and deal with like me mechanical royalties. And then you have to kind of, you got to deal with ASCAP and deal with the performance royalties, which only really worked if you had like radio play, you know what I mean? And so it got complicated and it got too complicated for people to even invest the time. Instead, what they mm -hmm. did is they went back into the studio and they knocked out another compilation. The last one Just took three to get weeks. Just to get the money. 
just right. to get the, the money. Last, they weren't thinking, right. they weren't thinking of the quality of it. Right, right. The last one, the last one took three weeks for them to produce. Mm -hmm. This one's gonna take two weeks. The next one they're gonna do in a week. Next thing you know, these guys are spitting out compilations every week. Like right. they're spitting out. You know, I, you know, I used to work the warehouse man in Metropolitan. I used to have to package and, and send these things out to 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 the retailers. And mm -hmm. these things were selling like, you know, and, and when you listen to them, I have some here. When you listen to them, you know, once in a while, you'll get, you know what you'll get from those? You'll get great right. songs. Great. Right. Producer, productions, however, you could hear. You could tell. You could tell. So, you know, so a lot of people were like, well, you know, that's what ruined freestyle. Again, mm. I don't think, I don't think so. I think, I think the compilation mm -hmm. movement, mm -hmm. what, what you was going to ask? No, no, I was going to change the subject, to, not to change the subject, but just to ask another question. You know, what? I was going to ask you, um, okay, we're talking about the compilations, but what about the artists? Do you think because they were so into your, your, you know, your, your look, you know, everything that you had in the eighties in freestyle, do you think they didn't think about that in nineties in the nineties? You know, um, everything was, everything was important in the eighties, the way you looked, the way you carried yourself, like everything was important as an artist. Yeah, you had to yeah. be able to dance. You had to have choreography in your show. Like you had to have, you know, everything had to be top notch. Almost like the way um, Hitsville was. Remember how Barry Gordy was? Yeah, yeah. You know, I remember. I remember rehearsing our show for like a year before we put out Show Me. I remember. Mm. I remember that. And we would go every day. Mm. Every day and go and rehearse our show. Our show had to be perfect. Everybody's doing everything exactly the same. We had to look perfect. Our hair had to be perfect. Our nails had to be perfect. Our outfit had to be perfect. Like everything had right. to be perfect. We had to not curse. Like there was like a million things. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you think that hurt freestyle as well in the 90s? Because I don't think people really put into it the way they put into it in the 80s. Yeah, I think because the the '80s, see, it wasn't just freestyle, but the '80s itself had it had a look. They had their own look, so that's why when you look at '80s, whether it was freestyle artists, a rock artist, even an R&B artist, what happened? The females had a lot of times they had the big hair, right? No, right? no, but that's not what I'm that's not what I'm talking about. Because no, even as the years that... went by, no, I'm saying I'm saying even as the years went by, in other types of music, they still did that. Look at Britney Spears, you know. Right. Look at look at those type of artists. They still use that formula. I'm saying when they stopped using that formula for freestyle, do you think right. that was a problem? I mean, it would have helped if if you know, but I think that had to do with you know management. You see, because you just said it. You know, when you were like Barry Gordy, you know, he, those artists didn't do that on their own. They would they would have to do it. But well, I knew well, artists that did it. No, but I knew artists back then who did it on their own because Sapphire right. did it on her own. I believe Sapphire that. Yeah. had quality. Everything had to be quality with her. Right, right. And I believe you know, that, and she did that certain, on her own. Yeah, I believe there's certain artists that, yeah, that did. That was very important. Um, I think Stevie but B had a real remember, look back in the days. Yeah, we, I remember Sunshine did the choreography. Right. Caroline put the outfit together. You know what I'm saying? Right. So... Right. Basically, we were artists that did it on our own. Now, yeah. I noticed that that quality wasn't the same no. as the years went by. Do you think yeah, that hurt no. free? <clears throat> I don't. I don't know. I don't know if it actually hurt it. It could. It could hurt the artists themselves. You know, it can. It could. It could kind of um, dampen. Uh, their their appeal to the or to the fans, you know, the fans like to see people that look good, artists that look great, that you know, are look shiny and everything's perfect. They like that, you know. So the artists. Well, yeah, that that's what survive. I'm saying. I'm saying after a yeah. certain amount of time in freestyle, you have people that would walk off the street, whatever they were wearing, just get on stage and perform. Yeah. Well, what happened was they were trying. They were trying to adapt. What happened was freestyle in the '90s. If you notice, they were trying to adapt more of that hip hop culture. I was talking about that before. You started to get in, get in acts that were going up there wearing jerseys, you know? That's not the uh, same thing I'm talking about. That's not the same thing I'm talking about because even a jersey 
can be a costume of, of a sort. You know what I'm right. saying? I'm talking about so, those people that seriously look, seriously look like they just got off the train. They were wearing that outfit for the whole day and they got on stage. Well, I think that I think those are people that that's just them. Those are the kind of people you invite them to go to your party and they look like they just came out of work. I think that's right. just people. And then they they have no management. They have no or I mean, forget about stylists. Stylists are on a totally different level, but at least management to look at them and say, hey, you know, you know, you know, I mean, I I learned that. And one of the people I believe it, now that way I learned from was through Manny. Manny used mm -hmm. to always talk about perception. He says, you got to give the right perception. He said, it doesn't wow. have to cost a lot of money. Manny, speaking of huh? Manny, Manny had fascination. Manny had Elsie. And she yeah. always looked on point. To this day, was, she always I, looks on point. And I Her choreography to, is always on point. Her show is right. always on point. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah and I wasn't with She's Manny. I wasn't. I didn't know Manny during his time of fascination. I know him right after, like just when they had parted ways. And I can right. guarantee you, I could guarantee you, because I agree with you when it comes to LC to fascination. I could guarantee yeah. you that a lot of that was influenced by him. Right. Because because we went through the same thing and he used to sit down and I used to I used to pick his brains, you know, and I used to see and you know, I dealt with a few acts. We've done a few quite a few things together. You know, so I always kept that. And when you and I got together and we were going solo, we were doing a solo thing. You remember that was a pretty important. Remember, we kept playing with the look, you know, right. Do you remember, we went and we went and we started shopping and we started like, yeah, because we were trying to look for something, you know? Yeah. You know, some of the stuff that we had was kind of cool because I look at pictures now. I'm like, OK, you know, yeah. we were doing that really cool kind of. And then and then, you know, you went kind of went back and it made sense. You was like, OK, well, you know what? People still, you know, they still, you know, categorize me as a cover girl. So let me try right. to, you know, kind of still keep parallel with that, but different, which I thought right. was genius, was, which was great, you know? And, and but, you know, but that, yeah. I think that's what it's about. But yeah, a lot of artists, even now, there's artists that look like they get on stage with the same clothes that they could go. What was the thing I used to always tell you about the outfits? Do you remember this? No, tell me. Remember, I used to say, if you can walk through a crowd in a club and people are not moving out the way and, and, and staring at you, then you're not dressed yeah. right. Right, I mean, right. Then, do you remember me telling you this? Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yes. so, you know, so if you can walk through a crowd and they're just like moving out the way because you're walking, but nobody's really looking at you, mm -hmm. then you're not dressed right. You're not, you're dressed, right. you're not dressed for, this, for the part, you know? Right. You... You just you like don't Susan. look special. You don't look special. Right. When you now you look at you, even with you when you do solo and it's not cover girls and it's just you by yourself, people look at you. They and you're little. And mm -hmm. still the career you look ten feet tall because of the way mm -hmm. you, you walk through there. The, you know, and it's not about, you know, name brand clothing or remember we talked about that. Yeah. It's not about it's not about all of that. You know? In right. fact, Name brand clothing is probably the worst thing to wear because you don't want somebody to coincidentally be wearing the same thing you're wearing. That's kind of whack. Not only that, <laughs> it kind of dates you. It kind of dates you. It, it does. It dates you, and it, it just—it's—I don't know. It's kind—it's kind of whack, you know. Yeah. But all right. But so now let's pull it. Let's come back. Now we're, we're here. 2020, 2021. Uh huh. What happened with that quality versus quantity situation? What do you see? In, in, what do you think I, is I more important I, for the for the artist? Do you think you know what? That's what I was gonna tell you. I'm torn right now because I think you need both. I think you need quality, but I think you need quantity in this you day do. and age as well. You huh? do. You do. Oh, thank you. you. Yay! You what see, do I win? What, what do I win? Uh, you get a kiss from me. Hey. Okay, good. Right. From who? Anyway. Who do I get a kiss from? From me. From me. Who else? <laughs> Nobody gonna kiss you. <laughs> <laughs> That's not allowed. Oh, snap. Hey, but 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 what I'm trying to say is that, exactly, and that's the answer. But you see, before quantity didn't matter at all. Right. It really didn't. Right. You right. know, of course, you need a, a certain consistency. But come on, uh -huh. Act will put a record out, right? How long did one record take to work? Three months. Wasn't that the magic number? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That was the three magic months. number. For it to kind of grab its legs, you know. Of course, people say it's six weeks, yeah, to get this point, and then it was this, and then, and then by that time, once it grabs its legs, and then now you're touring it, you're performing it. Now you got to find that time, go back in the studio, 
do it again. And that's how people used to fall off. Because that's a rigid freaking system to be on. You know? Right. So, but now, yeah, quality. But remember this also, and this is very important for, mm -hmm. for people to, to, especially new artists. Quality, just like anything else, is subjective. Mm -hmm. What I might think, and we, and this is very obvious because there's people who put stuff out that think that this is the greatest thing on earth. Like who, how can you not hear this? How can you not hear how perfect this song is? Then you're listening to, you're like, that shit sound like garbage because it's, sub <laughs> yeah, because it's subjective. It's subjective. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, you can't, you, you know, you, they can't. You can't say, well, they're wrong. They don't have good ears. No, maybe you don't have good ears. You know, like we exactly. don't know. Right. We don't know, you know. And then but I will say this, but I will say this. I've always picked a bunch of hits to perform. Yeah. So oh, I yeah. Think no, I no, you have got, a good ear. <laughs> you got, yeah, you definitely, yeah, you got, right. And there, you, and there are, there are those that have those magical ears. They have those, yeah. they have those golden but, ears, you know, but then you know, you know, you know what I hate? You know what I hate? I hate when people send me their tracks in a message and say, what mm -hmm. do you think? Please don't ask me what <laughs> I think. Do you want yeah. the truth? <laughs> I hate that. Please don't do that. You know what I find out? Well, this is what I do. I get that too. I find out if they released it yet. If they ain't released it yet. It's just like a demo stage and I'll give them my input. Uh -huh. If they already got that shit pressed on the compilation, don't ask so funny. That. So funny that <laughs> you just said that. So funny that you just said that. That's another problem I think with freestyle. A lot yeah. of these songs are actually good, but they still sound like demos. Like they yeah. still need some more backgrounds or, or, or another mix yeah. or something. Yeah. And, they, and yeah. you, you hear it, you're like, damn, this could be a really great song, but I don't think they put enough time into it. But, but, but how, however, I think a great song is always a great song. Yeah, maybe, the, yeah, the production, because you think about it like this, you think about any record that you love, any record that's a hit, mm -hmm. try singing that shit with no music. It's still gonna sound dope. With no acapella, just sing the song. It's going to sound right. dope. A dope record is a dope record. A song is a song. But yeah, but you, you know bring, what? Can you know you what? The, but sometimes what? it's not going to grab you right away if you don't hear everything right. like all working together. Well, what you happens? What, what happens? Yeah, what happens is a mm -hmm. bad production can take a great song and kill it. This is what right. I'm going to say. Say, right. so I could take a song like I could take a song. What's what's a really like, a, a dope song? Even an old school song. Let's say. A Diana Ross song, where right that you can right. sit there and you can sing the song, right? You can sing the song, yeah. acapella, and rock it, and just have everybody in the room just staring at you, right? However, mm -hmm. I can sit there and do a track that's garbage and play it for that same room, and they won't even pay any mind because right. I, my production done drowned it out and turned it into garbage. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So you know, people got to realize that yeah, a track can kill a really really good song you know um sure. i would always try to tell people to don't study other freestyle records nice. do a freestyle record do a freestyle record but study study, study some of the others study study listen to some classical listen to some r b listen to some right. salsa listen to how yeah. they're using the percussions Listen to jazz. Listen to how they're using, how they're playing the piano or the drums. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. listen to what's going on. Listen to the mix. Make sure you're mixing right. Understand that different genres of music require, you know, different types of mixes. Everybody, right. you can't have, that's why people want to do rock. You get a rock mixer. You can't get an R&B guy to come in and mix a rock track because they're mixed different. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the same. You do an RB song, it's all about the lyrics, the beat, and the bass. You do mm -hmm. a rock song, it's all about the lyrics and the guitar. They up front. And the drums are really actually in the background if you listen to a rock song. So different songs are mixed differently. And mm -hmm. if you don't know that, then you could wind up, you know, you're not bringing that track, you know. But let me, let me let's go back to what I was saying before. With 2020 now, and yeah, mm -hmm. quality, though it's subjective, quality, and I tell people to focus on their quality because it shows mm -hmm. that you love your, you know, be proud of your craft. Be mm -hmm. proud of your craft. Um, right. 
I wouldn't recommend trying to spit out, you know, a whole album in a day. Don't do one mm -hmm. of those, you know? Focus right. on crap. But, but quantity right now is the key. And the thing is, you'll put out a hundred records before you realize how important that quantity is. Right. The quality goes without saying. We don't, you know what I'm saying? Like we don't, nobody yeah. wants to listen and nobody should be putting out bullshit, you know? Mm -hmm. But right. quantity is very, very important now because the market is so noisy and the, the, the hustle for attention is very important, which is why you see social media statuses are based on how many likes, how many, you know what I'm saying? How many, yeah. you know, comments. This this is how people are judging um, the status. Now, you're not going to put a record out and get 5 million likes. But your 100th record might. Your 125th right. record might. Mm -hmm, the key mm -hmm. is right now is you're not losing anything. If you're not signed to a publishing company or someone who owns your your rights, you every record that you put out becomes a part of your major catalog. This right. massive say, catalog. Part of your catalog. That's just part of your catalog. Right. So look at every single record that nobody's feeling. Just put it on the shelf. You know, put it out there. Put it on the shelf. Keep, you know, perform it whenever you can. Keep promoting. And when I say put it on the shelf, meaning don't get don't sweat it. Keep releasing it. Keep distributing it through uh, mm -hmm. uh through through the social channels. But keep putting more records out because you know what? The 123rd record might suddenly blow up. And right. what do you think is gonna happen to those other 122 records? Yeah. If your 123rd record blows up, what's gonna happen to your other 122 records? People are gonna go back, just like with books. You go back to see what else they have. People, they, you know what? They're all gonna suddenly become popular. Right. Those records are all, they're all going to blow up. Let's, let's check these messages real quick. Okay. Honest. Hmm. Okay, thank you. All right. I think she is as bitch as Cardi B is. She is such a bad bitch. I don't like she. Okay, all right. One more. You are like Cardi B and I don't like her. That's the reason I hit you. <laughs> okay. Finally, we got a crazy. Thank you. I was with you. Yeah, that. we, <laughs> yeah, we got to get crazy. You said that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we got to hey, have hey, one. You know what? We got to let everybody know that if they don't catch this show live or don't catch it from the beginning, they can always yeah. go to YouTube. Yes. Yes. So, and check out yeah, this so show and past shows. Yeah, so we are uploading these to uh, to YouTube. So be on the lookout for that, just for anybody. But of course, these you can always come on here and listen to them on this platform as well. So, um, right. but uh, but yeah. So anyway, all right. So um, so just to cap off, you know what we were talking about. Just to cap it off, um, the quality versus quantity, which. People need to hear this. This is a very important topic, you know, and, and especially with these talks that we're having, people need to, to realize that, you know, there's, there's a lot of great information that you're not going to get other people to share. They're not going to, they don't, there's people out there that don't want to see you win. It's just nature. We want to see you win. We want to see the genre win. So anything that we're putting out there is, is, is real shit, man. It's real stuff. And, um, uh, you know, I would like for, to see people really tune into what we're saying, join in on the conversation, um, you know, vibe with what we're talking about, and then go out there and implement it. You know, if the freestyle genre and these artists want to make any kind of noise, they really need to stop listening to themselves and because they, what they're telling themselves isn't working. And they need to okay. they need to open their ears and they need to kind of you know listen in on you know topics like this and and engage and learn. I'm a learner, so are you. We've 
we've always been like that. We 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 know a lot of stuff because we we want to know. We want to, you know. I, I'm a student, constant student of everything I want right. to learn. Absolutely. You know, you know, and um, you know, and I want people uh, to understand that because we, you know, nowadays people can have the entire recording studio on their cell phone, and believe it or not, some of those recordings can <laughs> sound better than they did back in the in the nineties. <laughs> you know, uh, that's right. just the way technology is. Um, and a lot of people spend, you know, a lot of time writing songs. So songs, I don't think are ever going to be a problem, especially for freestyle. Mm -hmm. Freestyle probably has one of the greatest catalogs on earth. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of, I agree. Lot of, right, a lot of songs out there. I think people get scared. I can understand. Um, because I, I'm, 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 I'm pretty much on that level. People get scared to release stuff. And the, and, and the reason being is they're concerned with what other people think. And that's right. understandable because I'm like that too. I, 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 I think force they, my, yeah, but I think if they just be honest with themselves, honest with mm -hmm. their feelings, because yeah. a lot of times people think I'm going to write this and, and, and they feel too vulnerable to share with people. Yeah. Push that aside. Write what you really want to write. Write it from the heart, and right. that's what's going to work. You know. And listen, yeah. I was fortunate. I was fortunate and blessed to work with some incredible writers. Yeah, you were. Cole, incredible yep. writer. Andy Panda, yep. incredible writer. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I always had quality lyrics. Yeah. And quality. And I music. think. And I yeah, and still, I think, you know, I listen to sometimes, you know, people will send me a song and I'll it'll sit in my inbox for a while. Finally, you know, I'm doing something. I say, you know what? You know, let me let me just at least listen to this. And I will put it. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm standing in front of the computer listening to it. I'm like, yo, dope damn record, man. You know? Yeah. But what's, what's happening is that they don't get the rest of the process. Like, they think that's it. They don't get, they think, okay, well, so it's a great song. Mm -hmm. But if people don't know about the song, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna vibe with it, you know. And but also, you're have vulnerable. To know. If, if you're vulnerable with what you're doing, a lot of times when people are vulnerable, mm -hmm. that's when they get the best out of themselves, you know. Not only that, take chances. Even if someone writes a song for you, and you say, "I kind of don't understand everything," or "I understand it in a certain way." Yeah. You might look at it different in the future and say, well, I'm so glad I did this song. I look at no one in this world like that. I right. remember the third verse always reminded me of my parents at one point, which right. was the, and when I'm old and gray and in a rocking chair, I hope yeah. on my heart that you'll still be here. You know that part of it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now I look at it as myself. I look at it as right. me and you. It's crazy. Right. How you, right. how, um, and my heart skips a beat. Do you remember how I said I had never felt that in my life until we got together? Right. Mm -hmm. Now I feel like it, I've come full circle with some of my songs. Yeah. Yep. You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just take chances. Even take chances that other writers. You know, some people want to do everything themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's important. That's an important uh, part, too. I mean, they'll get just a, such a great uh, flavor of... Uh, you know, of, of material. But, you know, a lot of these artists, you know, I'm in the freestyle genre. And it's crazy when people are talking to me about an artist and I never heard of them. Mm -hmm. If I never heard of you, I'm always on social media, then there's something, you're not doing something right. And that doesn't mean spamming me or putting it in my inbox. I should see that. I should know something about you. Mm -hmm. Or you'll see an act that will come and they'll get a nice little run and they're top of the world and they disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, that happens a lot. Those people are just not meant to be part of the game, you know. Right. Um, but, you know, uh, anybody who has, who's a great writer, has like unlimited songs. Like, there's people say, man, what? I, I got 5,000 songs in the notebook. I can write a song a day. Okay. Write a song a day. Then go into the studio. If you have your own, and you think you're talented, or you have someone who works with you, spit that song out as fast as you can. Those going to take three months and try to have this major record release. Those days are over, man. Those days are right. over. You know, you you create a song today, it's finished. Put it out tomorrow. 
Right, right. And get to work on the next one. Work on it (laughs) and put it out the next day. That's the hustle these days. Anybody who's trying to, if I was an artist, I'm not an artist. If I was an artist trying to put out new material right now, that would be what I'm trying to, that what, that's what I would be doing. I would push everything else to the side and say, yo, you know what? I'm putting out a record every freaking day if I can. I'm just mm-hmm. gonna set, I'm gonna have so much material. Mm-hmm. And you know what happens during that process? What happens when you keep doing something over and over again? You get better and better at it. You get better and better. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, you know, that shit that you, you, you put out in the beginning that's kind of weak, the next one's going to be a little better. And the next one's going to be a little better. And you just got to keep doing it. And this is the key. And this has nothing to do with age. This doesn't have nothing to do with anything else. This is an artist okay. now, 2020, with all the social media platforms that we have at our disposal. Forget about putting, listen, people say, well, it's my money. Stop trying to sell your shit. Right. Because what you're doing is you're limiting your reach. Right. You're limiting I, your own reach. I agree. Forget about, you know, I know you want to make $10 or whatever. Leave that shit alone, man. Give it away. This would be my advice to every artist. Give it away. The money's always going to be in the performance and it's going to be in the catalog. You can always license those tracks later on. Track right. break blows up. Well, we were just talking about that, wasn't it? We were talking about the Rob Bass song. We were talking about the Lisa Lisa song. Right. But these songs right. now you're seeing them on, you know, years later, 30 years later on all these movies. Right. That payment is nice. I used to do licensing. There's right. some pretty good money involved in licensing tracks, mm-hmm. you know, even freestyle tracks, you know? Stop trying to, you know, cash in because what's going on, what's happening is, you know, you're putting a price tag and now people don't even want to engage with your stuff. Listen, I have books. I don't remember the last time I told people to buy my books. Right. I just pay people aware of them. I just put them out there. Mm-hmm. I make people aware of them. I don't have <laughs> no link back. I used to. I learned. I learned. I used yeah. to put link backs to Amazon. I don't anymore. There's not even a link there. I don't, matter of fact, I don't even talk about it. I, t- I might tell stories on, you know, something that might remind me of the post that I put, I put a story, but. Well, you know what it is? Everybody... You know what it is? What? It's not about them buying your book. It's about them reading your book. That's what's more important to you. It's not them buying yeah, it. It's about reading it. Yeah, it's easy to sit down and listen to a three minute record. <laughs> it's not, it's not that easy to get someone to spend, invest in a 300 page book. Yeah, there are people that have bought, purchased my books out of support, and I appreciate them. Right. But I would feel much better if they read it. That's what I'm saying. But you rather they read it and know right. the story, you know? Right. I want to be, uh, yeah, I want people to know me for this, you know? Now, books, of course, I can't do a book a day, but I write every day. So with a book, mm-hmm. I try to do a book a year. That's been my goal for the last, what, four or five years? Yes. And I pretty much I pretty much average that. Yes. I'm at a book a book a year, which is a which is a hell of a feat. Am I worried about it? No, because again, like I the same advice I'm giving to uh the artists is they become inventory. Mm-hmm. If book number 86 blows up, then all my other books that I spend so much time become valuable. And guess what? I own them all 100% because right. I'm not signed right. to a, a, a publisher. Right. So, you know, so, you know, so yeah, quality is subjective. Uh, that goes without saying, but quantity right now is key folks. Mm-hmm. If you're an artist and you're trying to put out records, you should be putting out a hell of a lot of records. If you're putting out a record a week or a record a month, that's crazy. You're not going to, you're not going to cap it. Forget about it. And if you're doing freestyle, there's a good chance that you're a little older. You ain't got mm-hmm. that kind of time to play with right if you have the means of putting out a freaking record every single day and you really if you really want this that's the kind of hustle that you you need to you need to put up there then you mm-hmm. should be spitting out a record every freaking day if that's the case right sounds like a hell of a feat you know you put out a record every day you know what you make a mistake you fall back okay fine i can only do one every two days that's fine but that oh yeah i'm working on this new release it gets 
released in April of 2021. That's ridiculous. That's good for the 80s. That shit don't work anymore. And you know, not only that, <laughs> enjoy enjoy the process. Enjoy the whole process. Yeah. Enjoy writing the song. Right. Enjoy recording the song. You accept know? Accept it as your art. It's your art. Right. And accept the fact that not everyone is going to if everyone likes your art, there's a problem. Then it's this not an art. You created a commodity. You don't want to create a commodity in in your work. Mm -hmm. Which means you you're nothing different. You're like a bag of rice or a bag of sugar or a Gillette razor. There's nothing special about you. That's a commodity. Right. So yeah. you don't want to be a commodity. You want you <coughs> want you you want to show your art. And if it's art, not everyone's gonna gonna love your art. So don't worry about what people say. You're gonna get those who don't like it. That's fine. It comes with the territory. In fact, it shows that this is some real shit. Yeah. Um, and just spit it out. It can be discouraging. I, I was just gonna say that. I was just gonna say that right now. Stuff that can be just but but. Right now, stuff that can be discouraging mm -hmm. can end up being wonderful memories in the future. Oh yeah, you know, because yeah. a lot of times when you're discouraged, it's because you're working through something, and then yes. you finally make it through it. Right, and that'll be a wonderful yeah. memory of how you made it through that time. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And 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 keep in mind, I'm not telling. I, I have my own struggles, you know, babe. I, you know, we talk about this all the time. I have my own. Right. I, I go through the same thing. You know, I put out a book that I spent you know, a few years writing that I put on the shelf that you were like, why is it on the shelf? What are you doing with this book? I was like, well, I already finished it. Right. And uh, yeah, it's a good book. <laughs> But what are you doing with it? I, I right. honestly didn't want to release the book. I was terrified and I still am. I'm terrified. I'm mm -hmm. terrified of, you know, when, when someone buys my book, I'm excited. When they grab, get my book and then they take a picture holding it, you know what happens? My heart starts to pound. Yeah. Because now I know they're going to sit down and they're start reading it. And now I'm giving them three books. So a lot of times they'll knock out the first one and they'll start the second one and I don't hear from them. And it, it's yeah. scary, but I got to keep in mind, these are three books. People do not usually read three books like that back to back. Yeah. These books are meant to be taking, you take your time <laughs> to read them. But you know you what? Know? But you're lucky in the sense that books are for a, for a lifetime. Yeah. You know, sometimes a yeah. record has a, a very short, you know, shelf life. You know, has a very short life. A, a song. It does. But a book the record, is for the record, the production, not always the song. Songs can be right, right, done right, later right. on. Lyrics right. last. Forever. But you know what I'm saying. You know right. what I'm saying. Right. A book can be forever, forever. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I, I that's how, and that's fun. what I do. Right, and that's Why don't what you I take do to psych one? myself. Yeah. What's that? Why don't you take yeah. this last one? Oh, okay. Hey, enjoying the conversation. Uh, didn't even realize you guys were on here. Um, I, I'm seeing that you guys have uh, quite a few talks up. Didn't even see you guys until today, but I'm following you both. Frankie Black, thank awesome. you, brother. Awesome. Thank you, Frankie. Yeah, and um, hey, check, out, check out the past shows, Frankie. Definitely check out the yeah. past shows. You can yeah. check them out here. You can check them out on YouTube. Yeah, wherever you're more yeah. comfortable. And please join yeah, us again always, tomorrow. Always, We're here every day. Oh, yeah, always feel free to chime in. Also, with we're, we're we're trying to we're trying to um we're trying to uh, kind of enlighten the our community that we you know we love so much and trying to help out those you know who can use our help. Um, so, uh, and just trying to share some of the information and, you know, hoping that people will take what we're telling them and kind of run with it. And, you know, and then they, they also have the, the, the opportunity to reach out to us directly. And if they want to kind of talk on a different level, but we're here, we're just, we're trying to do it for the community. We kind of hope people will tune in, but, uh, anyway, anyway, I appreciate everybody, uh, for tuning in. We're going to shut down now. Um, Please make sure to follow us, and um, uh, it's called uh, Freestyle Lives on Stereo. Um, we're here. We're trying to be here every single day. So far, so good. Um, it's still a work in progress. This is a new venture for me and my wife, for those who don't know. And for those who don't know, Angel is the original cover girl. She's the lead singer of the 
hit 80s girl group, which still exists today and still performs and still tours, the Cover Girls. Um, I have a career of, of, of uh, agent. I'm an agent manager for over 30 years. I've worked with every A-list uh, artist, freestyle artist you can think, as well as many of the old school hip hop artists. Um, I also manage acts like the Cover Girls, original Cover Girls, Little Susie. Uh, I created a group called SAO with Susie Andrew and Lizette Melendez and uh, and we reunited the original cover girls once again. So the, the, the genre is still very active. Even during uh, the pandemic, there's still a lot going on. We're heading out to Chicago for a big concert for New Year's Eve, which is also Angel's birthday. So I'm trying to tell people this to let people know that the market is still relevant. There's still stuff happening. There's still a lot of opportunities. And uh, we appreciate everyone who tunes in with us. And Absolutely. we just hope you grow with us. You know? Yeah, chime in. Let us know what you think about what we're talking about. All right, guys. I appreciate you. Thank you. Be cool. Be safe out there. And peace out. Bye.